So hallelujah. I'm so happy to be here. It's a privilege to speak with you. I've been kind of co-laboring with you kind of on the outside. I've been really close friends with uh, Pastor Bob and Carolyn for many years. Uh, I consider him one of my very best friends. Actually, you know, at the end of your life, some of you gray hair, you know, if you have a couple good friends in your life, you're fortunate, right? So I kind of had three people in my life, and one of, one of my best friends passed away last year. And uh, so it's kind of like Bob is the only guy left standing and another guy in Delaware. So uh, friendship is really important to me. And, you know, my heart is, I know it is your heart, is, you know, to continue to love and care for, for them. They're a gift that God's given us. And um, I'll say more about that later. Um, I have so much to say. It's like, Lord, give me the wisdom on to say what, what these folks here need, need to hear. But just a little bit about me. Um, I really am about revealing who the Father really is. And uh, a good friend of mine and I uh, wrote this book together. And I, you, you don't remember this, but you prayed for me about three years ago. And the doctor said that, told my wife, he has maybe a, another 24 hours to live. I had COVID. And, uh, and I don't know if you remember that, but, but Pastor Bob, you know, started like having everybody pray. And, and before I knew it, people all over the world praying. Will Hart stopped VOA to pray for me. And was, I mean, I literally had a miraculous healing. Uh, but yeah, amen. I mean, it's, it's a, like I've got this second chance. And I don't want to, I don't want to blow it, you know, and I can be honest with you. Um, I'm really just a broken man, but I'm held together by his grace and his mercy. I don't know about you, but that's, that's who I am. And, you know, the father's been so good to me. And so the doctor said, you'll always be on oxygen the rest of your life. You'll have heart problems. You won't be able to, you'll have to have one of those machines. And, and he took me up to heaven that night that they said I was going to die. And I had this in incredible encounter. And it was one of many that I've had through my life. And his love was so pure and so holy that I, I, I knew that, okay, I have, to, I have to, you know, continue on with the ministry. And I've always had the Father Heart ministry. But so here I am. I get home from the hospital. I'm on oxygen. And I was on oxygen full time for about eight months. And then at nighttime, almost a year and a half. So here I am tethered to a 50-foot air cord, you know, and that's all I had to do was 50 feet to my bathroom and to my easy chair. So anyway, that's how this book got wrote, was written. So um, anyway, I want to give this away to somebody who would, who would like this. Who would like this? All right, there you go, girl. Worship was a wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah, so... I was a teacher for about 10 years. I was a worship leader for about 10 years, a senior pastor for about 20 years, mixed with some, you know, running around the world. And uh, so here I am in my 70s, and I want to try to finish well. Uh, the message that I'm going to share with you today is, is, is my message. Like, you know, you have a life verse. Like, this is my life message. Like, after 40-some years of ministry, this is what I've concluded on what the gospel really is about. So I hope you really hear my heart on this. So here's my premise. Um, refreshing our first love is a continuation of the, our relationship with God as our Father and Jesus Christ who alone portrays his character and purposes. Our experiential relationship with the Father dictates the voice of the gospel we share with others. So what I'm pushing against a little bit here. I was raised conservatively, don't, you know, don't get emotional, don't, don't, you know, don't bend into a, your encounters, just trust the word, and I agree with all that, but what I want to share with you today is that it, that is actually a wrong teaching, because God, as your father, wants to have an experiential encounter with you. Amen. I believe that with all my heart, and, and now let me say this, because I'm a very passionate, emotional person, if you, you know, I mean, I... I just cried this morning during worship, like, oh, God, that's so good, so refreshing. You know, I love, I just, I mean, the worship was fantastic. We, as far as I'm concerned, we could just stay there, and I don't even need to speak. You know, let's just worship Jesus. But, but see, I'm a Jesus freak because Jesus is the one that showed me the Father. See, I, see, God so loved the world, 
so loved the world that he sent his son. Because the devil is the one that wants us to perish. Did you know that? And he's come to give his life and life more abundantly. So I want to talk about the value of encountering the Father and that this is the gospel. Encountering the Father is part of the gospel. And to me, it is the foundation of the gospel. And I'm a John Athenian theologian. I love John. I think about it because I don't, I don't have a doctor's degree like Dr. Bob and all this. And so I've got to get really simple like a little kid. Amen. So I figured, okay, when I'm reading the Bible, the person I'm going to trust most is Jesus. Amen. Right? I'm reading Jesus. Amen. Well, then the next person I would probably trust would be John because John was the closest to Jesus. And so I figured, okay, I can trust John, you know, to show me who Jesus really is and I've come to this place in my, in my heart, my ministry, is that I'm really focusing on, on the Son so I can know the Father. So here's a, here's a verse, 1 John, 4, 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4. So I'm talking about this is an experiential encounter. I mean, here's my message. I want you to know that, that the Father wants to have an encounter with you, and more than head knowledge. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifest, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy might be full. Hallelujah. That's experiential. They touched the very God of the, of the cosmos. They actually saw him and touched him and felt him and hugged him and loved him. And, and John laid his head in the bosom of Jesus. And he heard his, his heart going boom, 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 boom. The heartbeat of God. My first experiential encounter uh, was actually during Toronto. My church had blown up. My wife wanted to divorce me. She was on one side. I was on the other side. I was miserable. I, you know, I was done with ministry. I hated the church. I hated church people. I hated everything. But I went to Toronto. Hallelujah. And in Toronto, I don't know if you know who John Ornette is, but he was the leader there. And I'd been to Toronto before. Um, but this is kind of like our last stitch, like, honey, we're going up, and if God doesn't do something, we're probably going to go this way. John and it comes along, and she's like, bless him, Lord, bless him, Lord. And he's going along, it's about, you know, 4,000 people, and I'm, I'm along the wall. He just comes, bless him, Lord, and he just walks away. It's like, is that all I get? <laughs> you know? And all of a sudden, I just started kind of, woo, you know, like, I said, Betsy's my wife. I said, Betsy, I got to sit down. I, you know, I'm going to fall down if I don't sit down. And before you know it, I'm on the floor, and for 45 minutes, this liquid gold, I mean, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a vision. It was real. It was like literally something golden, glorious love, like being underneath a crick bed, if you're an old country boy like me, a crick bed. That's what it felt like rippling over me for 45 minutes. And I wept and I cried, and he changed my life. See, because I'd met Jesus, I'd been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I'd really never met the Father. Here is where the Lord thy God is one. And so that started me in a completely different path theologically, doctrinally, in my mission. And thank God my ministry was healed. And, you know, God showed up in a big bright light one morning. And so I'm calling you back into ministry. And that's another whole long story. And I could tell you story after story, but I really want to get into the Word. So it's hard not to tell stories when you're an old man. Amen. Can I hear that from the old brothers here, sisters? You know. So my, here's my emphasis See, in our Western culture, we've had a forensic viewpoint of God, which is a legalistic perspective, right? And I, I do not believe that that, I believe the overemphasis on the legal aspect of God has so imbalanced the gospel Amen. that we've forgotten yeah. that the truth is that he's a good, good father. Yeah. And so, so what I want to say is that God is a good father before he's a judge. Yes, there is judgment. Don't get me wrong. We're going to be judged according to his word. But he's not a judge forensically. He's not pointing his finger trying to condemn you, to, to call you out and say, shame on you. He's a father that says, come, let me bring healing to you. Amen. And, you know, that's what he wants to do with you as a church in this situation that you're in. He wants to embrace you and bring you together and love you as a good father and help you through this. It's his heart. And this is, this is not 
anything new. I mean, this is actually the foundation of the early church because I'm an uh, early church nut. I love studying the early church, and, and it actually helped me come to this place where I'm at because when I had this encounter, I didn't have the doctrine of the theology to back it up. And so I spent a lot of years studying doctrine and theology to say my encounter was real. It wasn't just some charismatic, emotional hippie crying and having, you know, some kind of ex- experience. This was the real deal. I met the real God, the real father of the cosmos. So here's a couple quotes. In the second century, uh, Origen, who was a church father, said, the affirmation of God being father lies at the heart of the Christian faith. It's the fundamental to the conception of the divine nature and salvation. To know God fully and thus to be saved is to know God as Father. Having been servants, we now become sons through adoption by faith through one who by nature is a son. (laughs) Wow. Third century, Athanasius. He taught that God the Father's divine nature was generative. Meaning, in other words, it, it just, you didn't get saved, you know, in 1977 like I did. When I met Jesus, my salvation is, is constantly getting bigger and larger and better. Amen. You know, it's like, so like I could say, I'm not completely saved yet. Why is that? Because the glory of God and the majesty of his kingdom and his love is so, his kingdom is an ever-increasing kingdom. So my salvation in that love is a continuing process. So I'm excited. If I could get it all today, I could wake up tomorrow and say, hallelujah, there's more tomorrow. Amen? So, see, I'm excited about this. So he said that, The divine nature was generative, giving life to the Son, and through the Son, thereby giving life to all other things. The divine nature is inherently relational, relational between the Father and the Son, and this relationship is where mutual love is both eternally given and received and to be the model of the Christian community. Wow. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So let me say this. The foundation of the kingdom, first of all, is built on relationship, right? How can we say that God is love? Because you can't love unless there's someone, someone there to love, right? So before eternity passed, before creation, before anything, God the Father, God the Son, God and the Holy Spirit were loving one another in relationship. And they said, you know, this is really good, this love that we have for one for another. Hey, let's create somebody and, and let them come and enjoy it with us. I'm sure Dr. Bob has talked to you about perichoresis. You ever heard that word, perichoresis? It's called the divine dance. And so it's like God is inviting the whole world to his dance. He, he wants to dance with us, you know. I, I can sing some old 70s. He says, let me dance with you. But I won't, I won't go into that. Cause... But that's, that's the heart of the Father is to include us in this love relationship. And that's why I say God is love. So... Here's kind of the, the foundation of, of really what I want to say today. It's in uh, the high priestly prayer. It's in John 17, 1 through 3, verse. Now listen to this very carefully. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting his eyes up to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to whom you have given him, he may give eternal life, Now listen to this. This is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Wow. Good. Thanks for putting the scriptures up there. So let me get a little bit nerdy with you, okay? I'm a a nerd. I like like looking up Hebrew words and and Greek words to see what they really mean. It's interesting that this particular word, to know, gnosko is what it means in, in the Greek. What we do, I might not pronounce it right. But it's the knowledge as the effect of experience. In other words, this knowledge is an experiential knowledge. And here, here's a couple of verses to show you how it's used in Scripture. So then Mary said to the angel, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? <laughs> we get that, right? That's an experiential relationship. Amen? Right? Here's, a, here's another place. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. Remember the lady that had the plague? So what I'm saying is that this eternal life, this knowledge is an experiential relationship that can be felt and experienced. Like what John says, we actually saw Jesus, the word of life. We touched him, we held him. So don't be afraid of encounters and experiences, but the only thing that you have to understand is that all encounters must be lined up with Scripture. 
And all scripture must be lined up with the word of God, who is Jesus. He's a person. You know what I'm saying? So encounter the scripture and Jesus, right? Remember Jesus told the, the Pharisees, he goes, you know, you search the scriptures and think you might find life in them, but you don't come to me that I might give you life. So, uh, so, so when I have any, these encounters, I had to study the scripture to say, am I just a charismatic nut and crazy? Or was this something real that happened? I mean, really, when this first happened, it was so dynamic that it changed my whole life. Amen. And what I thought I knew, I, I realized that that can't be true because all of a sudden I've met the Father and I found out he's not angry. He's not mad. He's not shaking his finger. at He's not ashamed at me. He loves me. Even, the, even in my sin, he embraces me. Amen. And so I began to study the scriptures and say, okay, now I'm going to study Jesus because all scripture must line up with Jesus as the word of God. And so that's how I check out my encounters. Amen. So I want you to feel safe with what I'm telling you. I just don't want you to think I'm some cuckoo puff up here, you know, telling you another story. I'm telling you that what I'm, what I'm, what I'm expressing to you, the, the encounter that you can have is, is so biblical and so pure and so holy that it is the foundation of the gospel. The good news is that God so loved the world that we might know him just not to be saved, you know, from hell and go to heaven. No, it's to actually know him and have the abundant life living in us today. Eternal life is the day. The day is the day of salvation. Hallelujah. Man, I could just speak in tongues right now, but I won't. Cause I'm so passionate about this. Jesus demonstrated a natural and personal affectionate relationship with the Father, and his desire is for us to have it also. And I'm always going to back up my premises with Scripture. Always, always, always. So John 16, 27, look at this. Now, I want to say one thing. The reason that I can embrace this for me and you, because in the high priestly prayer, Jesus said that I'm praying for you, but not only for you, but for those that believe in me through you. So that means I know I'm included. Because you say, well, that was just for the 12 disciples. It doesn't include me. No, it includes you. Because Jesus said it did. Amen. It's finished. Woo! I love this. John 16, 27. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, and hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. And in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Now, think about this. Look at that. He says, there's going to be a day that, I, that you don't even have to come through me. Like, what? Think about that. He was saying there's a relationship with the Father that you can have that you don't have to come through me anymore because you're, all, you're our son and the daughter. You, because you love me, the Father loves you. Now, here's the interesting part, right? In the Greek, there's four different words for love. Agape, phileo, storge, and eros, right? And so, of course, in the English, we, we miss a lot of the depth of what the, what the word is saying. Now, here's what's interesting. The word love, what do you think the Greek word would be in that context? Agape, phileo, storge, or eros. That's what I thought, too. That's what I thought. It's not. It's phileo. Phileo is this affectionate, friendly, friendship, love, lovey, kissy, I want to sit on your lap and be your best friend. Right? Now think about that. The father said, because you phileo my son, I'm going to phileo you. In other words, it's more than just, you better have knowledge of the great and mighty God or I'm going to send you to the place that you don't want to go and hallelujah, if you do the right thing, I'm, I might let you come into my heavens. No, he wants a relationship. Amen. Phileo, this affectionate, glorious relationship that we can come. And be with them. Uh, and I've, uh, I've had encounters like that so many times in my life. I had it this morning. I mean, I'm feeling the Father's pleasure this morning as, during worship. I'm just like, I just feel his love upon us. I felt his love for you. I feel the heart of the Father for you. He loves you. He's so proud of you. He wants to bring you through this, this trial because he cares about you. He fillets you. He's affectionate towards you. Isn't this good news? I love it. So... The mission, my mission, your mission as sons and daughters, now hear this, is to share their relational knowledge 
of the Father's character and purposes to others. Like I said earlier, how you know the Father is the voice that you'll give to the gospel when you're ministering to other people. Now, I'm not saying your encounter has to be mine. You're so unique, each of you are going to have a different encounter. Sometimes it could even be an intellectual encounter. I've had intellectual encounters of every door. I'm going to share at the end of the message. I'm going to share something I wept and cried when I was studying one day. I had an encounter intellectually when I found something about the word that I'd never seen. Like this passage here, when I first saw this, like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Here's, my, here's what actually my ministry verse. This is in 1 John. Notice I'm losing, using a lot of John because I trust John because he knew Jesus closest. 1 John 5, 19 through 20. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and give us understanding so that we might know him who is him, the Father who is true, and it's given us understanding that we might know him who is true, and we are in him, the Father who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, the Father. Now, it's interesting. There's two words there, no. If you look at the Scriptures, the first two no's is we've perceived through relationship that this is why Jesus came. In other words, I've been married. I'm going on 51 years in marriage. I know my wife. I know exactly who she is. The second word, no, he has given us understanding we might know him who is true. That's the word gnosko, the one I was speaking earlier about, and that's experiential relationship. So in other words, we've, we have the knowledge that we're of God and the whole world lies in the power of the, the devil. We've perceived that because we've been around the block for a few times. And we know that the reason Jesus has come is to give us understanding that we might have this experiential relationship with him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. That's what Jesus, this is eternal life that you might know him and his son, Jesus. This is the foundation of the gospel. It's just not to get you out of hell into heaven. It's to actually have you an experiential relationship with the love of the, of the triune God that created all that there is to be created. Hallelujah. So what's our mandate as brothers and sisters, as sons and daughters? What's your mandate? What's our responsibility? Well, our responsibility is to accurately reveal the Father. So how you have an experiential relationship with the Father is the type of ministry that you will have as spiritual sons and spiritual daughters and as a spiritual father or spiritual mother. In my book, I've, one of the key things that I've always wanted to express is that, and all of us at one time are, are going to become spiritual fathers and mothers if you're not now. <laughs> But the only way that you become a spiritual father or mother is, first of all, you have to be a son and daughter. See, because only the son knows the father and reveals him. Right? Doesn't it make sense? So I, I can't be up here as a spiritual father unless I've learned to be a son first. So I, I put it like this. The father-son relationship is a relationship of synchronization. Say, synchronization. Synchronization is the operation or activity at the same time or same rate. You guys got some water? I'm getting dry here. I'm preaching myself out of breath. Good, good. I was told when you're in Arizona, Arizona you got to drink a lot of water. Mm. I'll just hold it. So... The relationship between the father and the son is one of synchronization, the operation or activity at the same time, at the same rate. John 5, 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son does also. Now, here's my point. This is, you got to get this. This relationship was not mechanical. It wasn't like, okay, Jesus, go to your left three steps. Okay, stop. Look at, look at the fourth row and pick that person. 
No, he had so much experiential relationship with the Father that in every circumstance, in every deed, in every point, in every time, in every season, Jesus knew the heart of the Father so that he automatically knew how to deal with each person accordingly to the heart of God. See, he's a good father, and he has a whole bunch of children. Some of them have IQs of 90. Some have IQs of 190. Some of them want to be... Uh, airplane pilots, some of them want to be plumbers, you know, so, and he, you know, so if you got a whole bunch of children, you can't set up a set of rules for the whole family. Each child has to be dealt with uniquely. Come on. How many parents and grandparents do we have in here? So why are we trying to make rules and regulations to try to make people do the right thing when we're so individually created? He's a good father. And he's going to deal with you individually. But as you get to know him personally, experientially, then you in your life, how you treat your children, how you treat your spouse, how you deal with the public, how you work at work, whatever you do, what happens is you're going to have this knowing of, oh, okay, Father, I, I have your heart. It's just a knowing. I can't explain it, but as you know the Father, you'll know how to deal with everything in your life. I believe that with my heart. Trust me. And here's, a, here's an old school one. All the us... Old Pentecostals know this one, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean upon your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge. The same word in, in Hebrew, yada, to know. In all your ways, know him, and he will make your path straight. <laughs> See, we got to stop thinking on our own. we got to start thinking with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. How am I doing? 11.45. Yeah. I'm hoping to get to a place where I can tell you a story. I have so many stories to tell you, but I got to get the word out first. So the father-son relationship is at the heart of the gospel and our salvation, which is generative, as one of the early church fathers said. Like, there's something in me, there's an anointing in me, there's this thing in me that I'm actually influencing right now in a way that only I can influence you. And you only have the way to influence other people according to your uni uniqueness. Right? And indeed, our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That's what, how John wrote his first epistle, this father-son relationship. Jesus said, this is eternal life that you might know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave this life to his Son in himself. So it's, it's this father-son relationship because it's only the Son that can reveal the Father. And so that's why I'm a Jesus freak. That's why I'm a Jesus freak, because I've studied Jesus, and he is one that has revealed me who the true God is. This is the true God. This is why John said, this is why the Son has come, is to reveal that you might, Gnosko, experientially know the true God. Amen. And as you know him, that's how you express the gospel to other people. It's, this is so important. See, Jesus is the only one who fully knows the Father, and the Father only trusts the Son to reveal his character and purposes. Let me say that again. Jesus is the only one who fully knows the Father, and the Father only trusts the Son to reveal his character and purposes. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Okay, is there scripture for that idea? Yes, there is. Hallelujah. John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So no one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. So here's the Father. He's drawing people, drawing people, drawing people, because he wants everybody, by the way. He doesn't want any to perish. I'll actually use something Luke said. Luke, you're pretty close. You're a doctor. Luke 10, 22, Jesus, he's a, quoting Jesus. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son will reveal him. And, isn't that a mouthful? Listen to that again. All things have been handed over to me by the Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and, and the, who the Father is except the Son, and anyone whom the Son will reveal him. That's why you have to have Jesus. Amen. Right? I did an altar call two or three weeks ago. I was in Brazil with uh, Nick and Rachel Billman, the wonderful ministry called Chores of Grace. If you ever want to send money to a good place, send it to Shores and Grace. It's a, that's your commercial if you're watching this, Nick and Rachel. Ah, it's so good. And I was preaching this message, 
And they were telling me, and they had this like weekend retreat for all the staffs, about 140 people on staff with Nick and Rachel. But many of the spouses didn't know the Lord. Or that's what they said, they weren't sure. And, you know, when you prepare a message, you know, are you speaking to disciples? Or are you speaking to lost people? You know, I, in fact, I wish you were all lost this morning. I don't think you are. You wouldn't be here. But, you know, I would love, I love to evangelize. I'm really an evangelist at heart as a father. But I never thought about this. See, we've always taught, and this is the Western mindset of the forensic perspective of the kingdom. You know, God's a judge, and we've got to get you right so you don't get convicted. But what if, what if leading people to Jesus was based upon their acknowledging that they need love? Because if God is love, right? If God is love, and, and, the, and only the Father can draw us to himself, but, but Jesus is the only one that knows the Father, and the Father is the only one that knows the Son, and the Son who he reveals it to, why would Jesus reveal people, the Father, to them? So that we might know love, right? Because let, let me say this. My love is not good enough to help you. Pastor Bob, Pastor Caroline, all, all, all these people, the, the elders, your, your love is not good enough. You've all been wounded by false love because even your natural father and mother can't give you the love that you need. Even your siblings, your brothers and sisters, we can't give each other the love that fills that spot that fully brings us to salvation. So maybe if you were all a bunch of, of lost people, I don't want to say heathen or anything like that, but if, you, if, you're, if I did an altar call, said, how many people have been broken by people that were supposed to love them but didn't, and now you're broken and injured? Do you want to get healed? There's only one way. You got to accept Jesus. Amen. You got to accept Jesus. Amen. It's only through Jesus that you can receive the love that can heal you. Amen. See, that, that's the gospel. Amen. And there's no condemnation in that. But it is the truth. People need the love of God to be healed because I wish, I mean, as much as I love you, as much as I love Bob and Carol and all these, all, all, I, it's, my love's not good enough. I wish it was. I mean, I'd, I'd laid my life down freely. For them, I would, but it's still not good enough. It's only his love that can heal. It's only his love that can restore. It's only his love that can redeem. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And the good news is that he wants to have an encounter with you so that you'll know his love so deeply so that you can rightly minister as the best of your ability, his love to one another. That's really what I'm trying to do. Tell you one story, then I'll finish. So, I had this encounter in Toronto with Father's Love, and gosh, somewhere in 1997, 98. My life is in such trouble, I can't even hardly remember the year and date, but I just know it happened. And I had this encounter, but by the time I got back, the church blew up. They all separated. I went into a dark night of my soul. I was, you know, I had this encounter, but I didn't know what to do with it. I, I knew it healed me, but that's, that's all I knew. And then I had this encounter, bright light. He shows up, Doug, I'm calling back to ministry, do this, go here, do that. About six things he gave me to do, and I did them, started the church. So that's when I started traveling. I was, uh, when I got out of ministry, I became a real estate agent. <laughs> and the Lord says, uh, I'm going to bless you. And bring back all that the enemy's taken from you over these years. And so all of a sudden, I got into real estate, and everything I touched turned to gold. And all of a sudden, I had enough money to travel. So, so I said, well, I want more of God. And I'd been a charismatic Pentecostal believer. I've always believed in the full gospel, but I'd never encountered anybody getting healed. I never cast a demon out. I never saw any of the things that Jesus said I'm supposed to be doing. So I heard this guy named Randy Clark did that kind of stuff. I said, well, I'm gonna, I want to go and find out. Well, I ended up start traveling with Randy Clark, Dr. Randy Clark. Apostle Randy Clark, Brother Randy Clark, you know. And that's where I got to meet Heidi and Bill Johnson, Leif Hunt, and all those things. And so, you know, I'm traveling, and I'm in um, India with Randy uh, in 2005. And he had, every night he had like 45 to 50,000 people show up. And every, every night was a different 45, 50,000 people. And we're, I mean, just hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Hindus and Muslims are getting saved. Hallelujah, it was glorious. And one night, there was a, a quartered off area about maybe 50 feet by 30 feet around the, the stage that you couldn't get in. And all of a sudden, this, this crazy lady, this, and she was probably maybe not a lady, she was a young girl, really, 17, 18, jumps over the rope, 
start to turn around in the dirt, obviously demon-possessed, and it took four men to hold her down and to pick her up to take her to the deliverance tent. Because if you travel with Randy, you got a healing tent and deliverance tent. And I was new at this point. I mean, I did a little practice in Cuba and stuff, but... So I'm watching all these big wigs who are high, big deliverance ministries, and they're trying to, you know, get this demon out of this young girl. And they, and for two hours, they, they tried. And of course, you know, if you're with Randy, you, you get the, the seven or 11 model steps, you know, how to do deliverance, or how to do healing, which is great, by the way. And, but nothing worked. And so they finally said, well, well actually, I was with a little heart. He goes, Doug, I'm done. You're, you take over. I'm going, who, me? Little old me? <laughs> You know, like all these big wigs can't take care of it. What am I going to do? You know, and so I, I did it. I'm, you know, I'm standing here in front of this little girl. And I'm looking at this little girl and she's got demon eyes. I'm looking at the demon. I'm saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, you foul spirit. Come out. I plead the blood of Jesus. on. I have authority over you. You know, and I'm doing all everything I know how to do. About a half an hour, I am worn out. <sighs> I lowered my head. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Like. Nothing works, Lord. I, I have no faith. You know, I must be lost. You know, I mean, it was just terrible. All of a sudden, I looked up again, and I, I looked at this little girl, and all of a sudden, I realized, like, oh, my God. I've never looked at the little girl. I've been looking at the demon. I, and I, she was about the age of my daughter at that time. And all of a sudden, I realized, like, oh, this is somebody's daughter. And I said, I'm so sorry. I can't deliver you, little girl. But I know the Father loves you. And about that time, whew, the golden oil comes over me. And her, and all of a sudden the demon gets sucked back. And all of a sudden she's clear eyed. And I, because up to that point we couldn't even cooperate with her because she was totally, you know, controlled by this demon. And the demon receded and I said, Did you feel God's love? She goes, Yes. And I said, That was Jesus. Would you like to have him in your life? Yes. Can we together tell this demon to leave? Yes. Five minutes later, ah, the demon leaves. The little girl falls on the floor. They take her away. 45 minutes later, they bring her back. They dressed her, cleansed her. Most beautiful young girl you ever saw. And, th and this is what I learned. This is what I learned. That the devil has all kind of power and authority and wiles and tricks and all the things that even we have as Christians, you know what I'm saying? He knows, that he knows how to do everything. But you know what he didn't have that I had? The Father's love. Amen. The Father's love. And see, it was the love of the Father that that cast out the demon. It wasn't my authority. I mean, yes, it was my authority, in the, but the greatest authority is the love of God. Amen. That's the authority. It's the love of God because love never fails. Love never fails. And that's why I'm so, and, I, and, and then I learned like, oh my gosh, I got the greatest weapon. I don't need 11 step model. I only need one step model. The father loves you. And I can tell you story after story where I had deliverances and healings and Restorations just through the Father's love. I could just, I could spend the rest of the afternoon just telling you stories. It's so good. Oh, I would love to, but I know you guys have a part to do you too. But I think you're getting it right. Can you feel my passion? Yeah. And I want you to know it's just I'm just a broken man. I'm nothing special but I'm held together by his love and by his grace and by his mercy. That's, all, that's, that's the only thing that's holding me together. If he left me, I'd, I'd fall into pieces. You'd have to scoop me up with a shovel and carry me out and throw me in a trash can. There wouldn't be nothing of me. See, that's why John, 1 John 4, 16 says, we have come to know and have believed the love of God for us because God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And see, one of the challenges that I've had with people like, well, that, that sounds like just cheap grace or hyper grace or the love of God is to lay your life down. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. And he said, this is my commandment to you disciples. Love one another as I've loved you, which means will you lay your life down and die for one another? That's pretty tough. There's no, there's no cheap grace in that. True Christianity is learning how to die to self and to live for others. That's just a gospel, and it's scary because nobody wants to die. What's that old song? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Remember that old hillbilly song? Let me end with this one verse, and this is kind of like, I really want you to consider this, church. As, as we go forward and as we face the challenge of 
what you're involved in. And I know some of you are sad or angry or disappointed. I mean, all the, you know the, all the emotions you're going through. And I've been through that too. I mean, believe me, I've been at this picnic many times before. You know, I've been with Global for quite some time. I'm kind of the guy they send in to fix things, you know. I can't fix anything, but I know who can, hallelujah. But here's, the one, here's the, what I was telling you earlier, where I had this intellectual encounter that changed my life, that changed my life. I wept and cried when I, when I studied, and it's found in 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8. John says, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. See, he's a deceiver. I always tell people the, the original sinner was Satan because he deceived Eve, you know? And this is what John said. The Son of God has appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Now, so now, now let me get nerdy with you again, okay? This is the power of, you know, looking just beyond the English translations, but doing a little study, right? There's two words in the word for destroy in the New Testament. One is called apolomai. And apolomai is actually in, in John, first, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world who believes in him will not perish. That word perish actually means to destroy. So apolomai means to, like if you would take some, uh, uh, draw a piece of clay dirt and take it in your hand and, go, and just crunch it up and go, and it's completely dissipated and gone and destroyed. That's apolomai. It's the word that John uses here is not apolomai. You want to know what it is? It's, it's really great. And you can look up in strong concordance. You can look at this for yourself. Luo. And the word luo has quite a number of adjectives, but the ones that really struck my heart is that Jesus has come to unravel or to untie the works of the enemy. You see, now, why is this important? Right? You see, from the forensic view of much of the Western church is... It's you make a mistake, you sin, and now you have to be punished, right? right. So, so we have to punish people because they've sinned. Right. So the person that's been sinned against, we, we gather around them. We, we want them to be healed. But the other person, left foot of fellowship, and you're gone. See, but that's not the heart of the Father. See, the heart of the Father Amen. is to untie what the devils did because he wants us as sons and daughters to be about his business, and so the, gospel, the good news of the gospel is Jesus is to un come to untie, unravel what the devil's done in their lives. And that's your mission from this day on. Your mission is to say, what can we do to participate with the heart of the Father to, uh, to help untie what the enemy's done in our congregation? And I'll be dang if I'm giving up. I'll be, I am not giving up. I am not going to lay down and die because the devil has, has caused a lot of trouble. I'm going to rise up and fight with the love of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against, we're, we're fighting against the enemy, and he's really smart. And you can't outsmart him. Don't try. But he, he doesn't have love. See, if you if you'll walk in love, because Paul said love never fails. If you'll walk in the encounter in the of the Father's love in your life, you can help, you can partner with Jesus and begin to untie the work of the enemy. I mean, that's what a good counselor does, right? You go to counseling. So to me... This is the gospel. This is the good news that, that God has come, that we can have this experiential encounter with him to know his love because now that I know his love, I know how to deal with each person, each situation. And I know that I'm going to win because love wins. <laughs> All the time. Amen. So that's, that's basically my message, guys. That's, that's why I've come to share it with you. And yeah. So I don't, I, don't want you, I don't want you to lay down and let the devil kill you guys, all right? Right? The enemy's come to rob, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give his life abundantly. And I want you to participate with that life. I want you to participate. And what can you do to untie what the devil's did here? And these precious people that we love. And you have to pray, Father, what can I do to participate? We're not going to run. We're not going to hide. We're not going to be pointing fingers. We're not going to shame each other. We're going to say, Lord, how can I be part of the answer? How can I untie what the devil's done? Because we got a great work to do Amen. here in Tucson. Passion, Passion Church has, has an identity and a purpose that God has only given. And all you guys can do it here. You're the only ones. He's, he sent you here for a purpose. 
in Passion Church to destroy the works of the enemy. And so I challenge you today to take up the mantle of that ministry and be untires, be unravelers of what the devil's done and bring life to wherever you go. Speak life, give life. And you do that through a demonstration of his love. Amen. Amen. Whew. Hallelujah.